We are so excited for our opening fireside chat today, where we have Tom Khalil and Mariana Mazzucato. And we're gonna talk about the role of government in really nurturing entrepreneurship for societal and public benefit. Uh, I don't think we could have two better people to really have a conversation about this. Uh, there's so much to say about each of them, but I'm gonna give you a brief uh, bio for each. And then in the speaker notes, their full bios are in there and well worth reading. So first, Tom, he's the Chief Innovation Officer at Schmidt Futures and an EIR at UC Berkeley. Previously, he served as the Deputy Director for Technology and Innovation for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. During President Obama, Barack Obama's administration, Tom was also a senior advisor for science, technology, and innovation for the National Economics Council. Mariana is a professor in the economics of innovation and public value at the University College London, where she is the founding director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. She is the author of The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Private Versus Public Sector Myths, and The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy. And I think she also has an upcoming book this year, which I w cannot wait to get my hands on. So in our prep call, uh, which is usually kind of a boring thing with speakers, there was so much goodness going on between the two of you in talking about what is the role of government in nurturing big moonshots that will benefit society. And so I wanna just kick us off, um, and maybe I'll start with Mar Mariana. So when you step way back, 2020 has been just an insane year on so many levels and has kind of laid bare many, many societal challenges, but also what the role of innovation will be to bring us over the next two, three, five decades into a better place. So when you step way back and, and if you had a magic wand and could do what you'd want to do, talk about what the role of, who are the actors and what are the roles they are playing and why is government important here? Right, so great question and, and uh, it, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and yes, you're absolutely right. In our pre-event <laughs> call, we started saying, wait, hold on, we gotta stop. We're gonna talk <laughs> ourselves out and have nothing else to talk about. So, I mean, I think we need to always remember that government is always there. Um, the question is, what kind of government do we have? The private sector is always there. What kind of private sector do we have? And I think that the COVID-19 moment is one which does kind of force us, because we don't have much time, people are dying every day, to really rethink the ways to work together that we can race towards things, you know, race towards the vaccine. That expression is out there, but actually do it in such a way that we govern the process for public benefit, the title I think of this session. And we need to admit that that's hard. It's not enough to have, you know, public money, private money, kind of stir the minestrone soup. I'm Italian, so I think in terms of food um, and, you know, hope for the best. The issue of how do we actually govern both corporate governance, but also, you know, public sector institutions. Um, I don't think it's it's been thought enough of. And in fact, you know, because we admit that the private sector is important, for value creation, there are these great classes, right? That you know, uh, uh, managers go on and masters programs. They take strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior, and it's all about intra-organizational dynamics. How to you know think out of the box? How to uh, you know take risks and not worry too much about it? You know, do trial and error and error. Think in a portfolio investor kind of mindset. And unfortunately, because we've kind of dismissed the role of government, we haven't necessarily you know, thought about its role beyond this kind of classic idea that it's there to fix market failures. And the problem is there are lots of failures, but if you're always in a fixing mode, you're always gonna be kind of too little too late. So I think that the expression of building back better now with the COVID recovery that everyone's you know, trying to uh, uh, construct, we need to start 
being much more objective oriented, right? Building back better doesn't mean you just ask the government to come in and bail out, you know, companies that absolutely need help right away. It's about also structuring those recoverings, uh, sorry, recovery funds so that we actually have, for example, more inclusive growth, more sustainable growth. And this is where I'm really looking forward to this conversation because what we've been talking about both pre-event and now is the need to really focus innovation policy, industrial strategy, and really policy per se, to be focused on outcomes. So this notion of mission orientation, you know, it's, it's, it's so needed right now because there, there are all these problems that COVID have, you know, has thrown our way, not just around health, also the digital divide and so on. But what does it actually mean for the design of a policy to be outcomes oriented instead of just making a list of these random categories like small medium enterprises or a list of you know sectors that might be the pet projects of a particular uh, policymaker or even a list of technologies the the most important technologies that we're still you know using and that kind of define our era like the internet were actually outcomes of problem solving right the internet was the outcome of trying to get the satellites to communicate and there was a particular organization DARPA that helped fuel both the imagination and the investment towards that. And people talk about DARPA, but they don't talk enough about other types of organizations that have also been problem solving ones. And I'll shut up in a minute, but just to say there's many public organizations that are not problem solving. They literally are there just to give out handouts, guarantees and subsidies. And in the process, they don't really create that catalytic effect across the economy, which DARPA type institutions have done in the past. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm very curious to talk to Tom now about kind of you know, going into the details of what does that actually mean for social problems, not just the kind of technological ones that getting to the moon. Yeah. So thank you, Mariana. So Tom, just to kick you off, because you have such a rich history, both in the Obama administration, but also now with Schmidt Futures, in thinking through what are the big moonshots and what do we need to do um, to again get us to a better place as a globe and 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 certainly U.S. society, and when you think of that, can you tell me how has it shifted over the last year with this pandemic, or did we already already know this and and we know exactly what to do to push us forward? Yeah, so I I really like this idea of identifying goals that are ambitious. Uh, and that if we ch achieve them, it would be a big deal. Uh, and we have some reason to believe that that goal is now within reach. Um, so it's not like eliminating scarcity uh, or uh, teleportation. Uh, but uh, something has changed about the world. Uh, a policy innovation, uh, fundamental science, uh, the advancement of technological change that leads us to believe that what is what we might have viewed as impossible uh, five or 10 years ago, we now believe is within reach. Um, and, you know, I'll just give you an example of, of something that I worked on uh, for uh, President Obama, which has certainly become a lot more relevant. And that is dramatically reducing the time uh, to develop vaccines and, and therapies. Um, so I, I think our view was that, uh, you know, this is something that is going to take a, inherently going to take a long time. Um, and that we kind of have to start from scratch every time we have a new emerging infectious disease that we have to deal with. So during the Ebola outbreak, we were able to get some additional funding for DARPA, which had an idea uh, led by uh, Dan Wattendorf of dramatically reducing the time to go from bug to drug. Uh, and so the idea is that you would identify people who have been exposed to a pathogen and survived, identify the most effective antibodies, and then either create an antibody-based therapy or use gene-encoded antibodies to create temporary immune protection. And that the process associated with, with doing that uh, would be much shorter, uh, number one. And number two, this would be a platform approach. So as opposed to, again, starting from scratch, there would be a well-understood process uh, so that you know as soon as we have the information about the antibodies or uh, the genetic uh, composition of, of the pathogen that we could be reasonably certain uh, that we would be able to develop something which is safe and, and effective. So that's that's one example. Um, I think there are a bunch of areas where we need uh, 
progress in the energy and climate, both with respect to deployment of technologies that already exist and are mature, uh, like uh, solar, wind, and uh, electric vehicles, uh, but also uh, with respect to uh, areas where we don't have a solution yet, whether it's carbon neutral building materials or uh, the work that uh, a really interesting set of fusion startups are em embarked on uh, or sustainable hydrogen uh, or uh, next generation carbon neutral or even carbon negative biofuels. Uh, so I think that the events of the last year or so um, have increased the visibility of these big challenges that we face, whether it's in global public health or racial justice or energy and climate. And I think a really important goal uh, for the government working with the private sector, working with academia, working with civil society organizations is to identify some of these big, hairy, audacious goals. Uh, and then, as, as Mariana said, uh, to build coalitions that are capable of not only tackling and solving these problems, but doing it in a way that allows more people to participate. Mariana, I'm not. Uh, the two of you are going to keep talking to each other. I will only interject questions when we need to. So I know you have something to say about that and maybe climate change and role of government in that, but I'll let you take it away. Sure. I'm, I'm noticing that I'm very fuzzy, so I'm going to clean my camera. <laughs> <laughs> very embarrassing to do these things live, but hey, that's what we're supposed to do. Look yes. human, right? Not like robots on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's called the kids who come with their jelly fingers. Um, yeah, we definitely need a mission for that. Um, so, I mean, what I'd be very interested in talking to Tom about are the more controversial bits, right? Because it's very hard to find someone who says, oh, we shouldn't have kind of moonshot thinking. But when you break it down to what it means for this issue of governance and what then is the role of the state, I, I, I think there it becomes interesting because often the perception is that you need the state to fund kind of basic R&D, the blue sky stuff. And then kind of like you were saying um, in the introduction, um, you know, that then venture capital will come in and, and, you know, it's very important. But actually, you know, patient long-term finance also provided by the state is very important. So it's basic research, applied research, institutions that foster those relationships, patient long-term finance downstream, well-designed procurement, but also those demand pull kind of policies, right? Which then act as funnels for diffusion and deployment of technological uh, um, changes. So for example, without suburbanization, we wouldn't necessarily have had the full diffusion and deployment of the mass production uh, revolution, all the possibilities that provided. And in some ways we could be arguing that today green is the demand pull for the ICT uh, a revolution which still hasn't been fully diffused. But in terms then of how do we govern the process between public and private then throughout the whole innovation chain without pretending that it's just you know basic research by the public sector and then the private sector later comes in. Um, and this issue of forming proper partnerships that Tom, you know, you just repeated. What do you think about really also looking at some of the contractual issues, right? I've always been shocked that the National Institutes of Health, for example, invest 40 billion a year in health innovation and then don't kind of bother to make sure, and it's not necessarily their role, but let's say the government doesn't bother to sure. make sure that the prices of the drugs at least reflect that public contribution. So the pricing theory of value-based pricing doesn't take into account at all the public fund or the patents themselves tend to often be abused. They're too upstream, they're too wide, used for strategic reasons, they're too strong, hard to license. So how can we, do you think, because I've got my own ideas, but I'll come back with that. What do you think are the kind of more uh, interesting tools through which also to focus on making these partnerships symbiotic and not, dare I say, parasitic? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's a great question. And I wanted to pick up on one of the things you talked about, which is, uh, looking at not only the science and technology push uh, that is funding for, for blue sky research, but also identifying those areas where uh, the private sector is, is likely to underinvest and we, and we need to have uh, more of a role for the state. Um, so uh, let me give two examples uh, that I think are really promising. One is uh, vaccines for diseases of the poor. So left to their own devices, drug companies are not going to work on that uh, because poor people have no money. 
Uh, so uh, thanks to some work by Michael Kramer, five countries in the Gates Foundation went to two uh, major pharmaceutical companies and said, if you develop a vaccine which is safe and effective, we will provide a copay of X dollars uh, per dose um, as a way of incentivizing you to, to not only develop the vaccine, but manufacture it at scale. And in return, um, after that sort of initial period of, of subsidization, uh, then we're going to agree on a tail price uh, for that uh, so that developing countries can afford this on their own because you're pricing it at marginal cost. Um, so one of the really important things that you said, Mariana, was uh, outcomes, right? So identifying those areas where uh, the public sector has an outcome that it's trying to achieve. In this case, the further reduction in, in under five child mortality uh, by having more vaccines for vaccine preventable diseases. More on, on sort of the glitzy side of things, um, when the US retired this uh, the space shuttle, the US had to start paying the Russian government, I think roughly $80 million per astronaut per seat to get up to the International Space Station. Um, and so they decided to partner with several US companies, including SpaceX, uh, and said, we want a rocket that will go up to the International Space Station, deliver and retrieve cargo, and ultimately astronauts. And we will provide you with a set of milestone payments for intermediate progress towards that goal. And then we'll just start buying rides uh, once that rocket is available. And so NASA was able to get for roughly 400 million, what would have cost them 1.8 to $4 billion on a business as, as usual process. So having the government be clear about what the outcomes that it wants, um, providing incentives for the private sector, uh, and uh, uh, and having the government say, we're prepared to bear, bear the demand risk if the private sector bears the performance risk. So this advanced market commitment happened during the Italian presidency of the G7. Um, and the reason that the finance ministers really like this idea, it is that had GSK and Pfizer not developed a vaccine that was safe and effective, um, the governments would have been out zero dollars. Uh, and so I think it's sort of a clever allocation of risk. And there was this idea of negotiating a tail price uh, so that uh, after this sort of initial period of, of copay from the government, uh, you were pricing the vaccine at, at marginal cost and making it more available to uh, uh, developing countries. But I'd be curious as to how you're thinking about as, as you said, uh, that these uh, deals that we're making, these partnerships that we're creating are genuinely win-win uh, between the private sector and, and citizens. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's different issues. And the most important one is the one you just mentioned, which is if you're goal-oriented, then at least at the end, <laughs> if all else fails, uh, besides the goal itself, you've achieved something together that's actually needed by um, you know the the public, and by the public, we should always remember it's not the state, right? The state, at least in democratic countries, is supposed to be working for people. So we're really talking about kind of people oriented, or the, the notion of the common good, as Pope Francis has been advocating. I'm not religious, but I have found his speeches recently very interesting because he's he's much more uh, honest, I think, than many politicians on just how sick our current way of doing things is and why we need change. Um, and he's kind of resurrected this concept of the, public, of the common good, which I think is a stronger concept than the notion of the public good. The public good is framed, at least in economic theory, as the correction for something the private sector is not doing. In fact, I think your own language was, was alluding to that, and, and I speak like that too, right? So the, pub, the private sector is not, say, investing enough in basic research, that's the public good. The state uh, you know, invest in it precisely because the spillovers are so great. So there's little incentive for one company to invest in it because they can't appropriate the returns all to themselves. Or the opposite, a negative externality like pollution, government comes in, does something like a carbon tax. But the notion of the common good is something much broader. It's actually about objectives, not corrections. And we don't really have that kind of objective oriented language even in economics. So even the public good itself sounds good, but it's, it's, it's again a bit too narrow. 
Um, and so actually, you know, for example, in a moment like this, being clear that we have specific problems and we need both public and private actors to come together to work towards them, like reducing the digital divide, that's first a great thing, because unfortunately, sometimes we don't have that. You might have a whole kind of health sector, which brings in the private sector because of objectives of commercialization. We want more jobs, so let's bring in private sector jobs into a sector without then really saying why, what are we actually trying to do together? And that's what I think you were just talking about. But the other thing, which I was sort of getting at when I talked about prices, which you gave great examples of, but also how do we govern the patent system? I think that eventually we actually need new types of contracts, right? And, and the pricing system you just mentioned surely had a legal kind of you know, uh, document underlying it. And I often ask myself, why is it that then we don't have actually some ambitious contracts which really explicitly admit that both public and private are taking risks? So even the language is all about de-risking. Right. So the public sector is de-risking the private sector. So by definition, the private sector is seen as the risk taker. But actually everything in our iPhone that makes it smart and not stupid, which was publicly financed, Internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, for each of those successes, there were many failures. Those were a form of risk taking. And so when you actually go downstream, so not just the upstream basic research, but if you look at the companies that have benefited also from what I called before patient long-term finance, you have companies like Tesla, like Solyndra, which both actually during your uh, you know, work uh, time with Obama got money from the government uh, in terms of a guaranteed loan, right? This is different from R&D. And whereas with R&D, I wouldn't argue that the government should be worrying about things like you know, a monetary kind of rate of return. You really just want the spillovers to be as great as possible throughout the economy. These downstream investments that, go that government has made in all sorts of different companies in terms of giving them specifically the company itself that kind of guaranteed uh, period of you know helping them through the most risky phase it's incredible the lack of kind of creativity and how to structure that portfolio so we ended up having government bailing out Solyndra which went bust uh, same amount of money went to Tesla and somehow someone advised Obama to say to Elon well if you don't pay back the loan we're going to get three million shares in your company which made no sense. Why would you want 3 million shares in a company that you know, doesn't pay back its loan, you know, maybe because it's not a great company? Had he said, you know, I'm going to think about this as a portfolio because the state is not just a lender of last resort, but an investor of first resort, is an active risk taker, not just a market fixer, but a market shaper and creator, then you know, he could have said, if you pay back the loan and are successful, we're going to get for a period you know, 3 million shares in your company. The price per share for Tesla went from 9 to 90 during the period. 2009, 2013, that difference multiplied by 3 million shares would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss in the next round. So that example I've just given is something much more concrete also, maybe too concrete right. in terms of it's thinking about financial returns. And the risk, of course, is if the government starts thinking about financial returns, it'll actually stop kind of doing the kind of big thinking and worry about making money. But I actually think that you can combine the two you're going to be mission oriented, big goals of a portfolio of investments in order to make sure that you're also being rewarded for the successes and not just kind of, you know, bailing out the losses. It's useful to start having that kind of investor portfolio mindset, but for the public good. So can I break in there? So Tom and, and then Mariana as well. So we don't live just in the U.S. by ourselves, right? We are in a globally sure. competitive system. You know, there's lots of talk about China and how different that system of support is for the different kind of foundational technology industries that are coming up, whether it's quantum or AI or, you know, or fusion. So if you're... If, if you step back and it does, whoever wins this election, we're not going to determine that today, but whoever wins in this next administration, how are you going to coach them to think through how to continue to make the right investments so that our economy keeps growing and we're producing things of social or common value for the country and the world? So I wanted to talk about one thing which I don't think gets enough attention, um, and it relates to Mariana's comment about missions. Uh, and one question is, what are those missions? So I think in some areas, uh, particularly national security, energy, space, and the biomedical dimensions of health, we have 
uh, competent and well-funded science agencies. So we have institutions like RPE and DARPA uh, and NASA and the National Institutes of Health. If you look at the agencies that are responsible for education, workforce development, human services, affordable housing, reducing the intergenerational transmission of poverty, those agencies either have very modest research and development capacity or capacity to promote innovation related to their mission, or it's non-existent. Um, and so my hope is that, uh, you know, in the next Congress, uh, there can be a discussion about, do we want to uh, use some of the same science, technology, and innovation tools that we've used in other areas to promote a broader range of these societal outcomes. Um, so an example of, of a challenge that, that we're facing is stagnant or declining real wages for non-college educated workers, and certainly with the potential that technological change could further reduce the demand for workers with relatively low skills. Um, and I'd love to see a capacity to use innovation as one of the things that we try. I'm not saying it's a substitute for other policy changes like expanding the EITC or uh, uh, strengthening worker voice. But I think if you're going to come up with a list of things to try, then science, technology, and innovation should be one of the things on the list. We've already seen proof of concept uh, from a DARPA program where they've been able to support the development of AI-based digital tutors that can give new Navy recruits a technical skill in months rather than years. So within five to six months, they're outperforming people who've been with the Navy uh, for, for nine years. And so it suggests that uh, there are technologies that could reduce uh, the time and cost required for a non-college educated worker uh, to gain a skill that is a ticket to the middle class. So that's one thing I'd like to see is what are the missions, what are the big societal challenges that we face where we don't, haven't traditionally thought of R&D as a way of, of helping to solve that problem, uh, but upon further re reflection, it's something worth trying out. So that, that would be one thing that's on my list. The work that uh, Tough Tech, um, the Tough Tech community is doing in terms of uh, increasing our, our investment outside of the software domain is, is really important. I think there are some interesting models um, that uh, Elon Gurr uh, and uh, the Activate team uh, is beginning to experiment with, uh, that uh, uh, Cornell Tech uh, is beginning to experiment with, with the startup postdoc program of how do we increase our ability to have innovation, not just in software, but in advanced materials, in clean tech, uh, in advanced manufacturing. Um, I, I think that these areas are really important too and, and haven't been getting the investment that they, that they need and deserve. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, when I talk about mission-oriented policies today and the work that we're doing through my institute globally, it's always about exactly what you're talking about, which is think of the the kind of social problems that we have and treat them with the same urgency and creativity that we've treated, you know, these kind of more technological feats like going to the moon and back. And, you know, we do have a set of objectives. There's 17 sustainable development goals, which every country has agreed to, basically has signed up. And when you sign up to something, you're supposed to, at least in theory, be serious about it. Otherwise, what's the point? And I think there's a real opportunity to use the 17 goals. So I have them in front of me here. You know, the first one is no poverty, second, zero hunger, and you move on. There's ones around climate change, life underwater, et cetera, to turn them, because these are broad challenges in the same way that Sputnik in the space race was the you know, broad challenge that stimulated the, moon, the, the Apollo program. Um, these are the challenges that then I think have to be really nested within local context because they're, they're challenges, they're inspirational, but what they actually mean for a particular region of the world, develop, um, depending on its development uh, trajectory, or whether it's a city versus kind of a village or a particular kind of region, that will differ. And that's where I think it's really important to bring citizens or different voices to the table, I should say, not just the usual suspects like ourselves, to really kind of you know, co-design and co-create missions, for example, again, at the city level, instead of just saying carbon neutral city, we need conversations about how do we actually want to live? And I actually... I think 
and a fantastic creative artist, Brian Eno, who's a music producer, attended. And he said, uh, he kept saying, why do you guys keep assuming that people just want to go from point A to point B uh, <laughs> quicker? What if it's also about experiencing, you know, the city in new ways? So that whole idea of also along the way, create more, um, you know, human and, you know, better ways of living our spaces. But, you know, there's no point in having that idea top down and having it truly co-created. But I actually have here, and I'm going to show it because I love these big poster boards instead of PowerPoints. I don't know if you can see it, but the idea, this is just one of the boards we've used for the work. The idea is you begin with, you know, a goal like climate change, turn it into something very specific. The carbon, but then instead of having the old policies that are based on just lists of sectors, you get all the different sectors that are, you know, in your economy to really be thinking about what their role is around that objective. But the kind of projects here, I don't know if you can see these, uh, these uh, uh, circles, these are like the hundreds, the, the, you know, hundreds of different projects that might come to the table that need to be crowded in kind of bottom up. And that's where you have a design challenge. You know, how do you actually redesign static tools like procurement, grants and loans, which might just be kind of handouts to lists of types of companies or actors to really galvanize and crowd in as much experimentation bottom up. And for that, we've been looking at places like Sweden, for example, which recently has been doing exactly what Tom was talking about, which is to use the welfare state itself and breaking it down into different types of public services to formulate missions. So they had a mission around school meals. They said, um, let's make a mission to be for all school me meals to be as healthy, tasty, and sustainable as possible, which actually meant you had to look at the whole value chain of production, distribution, and consumption uh, of, you know, the food that was coming to the schools and really make sure that its own production actually was as low, you know, had as low carbon emissions as possible, but also were tastier than just, say, Ikea meatballs. Uh, but using, you know, different public goals, we already talked about the digital divide, but really using the welfare state and reimagining all the public services, like public transport, public education, public health, um, as areas where we can be as creative and ambitious, uh, but also to treat these areas as urgent as we do during wartime or during pandemics, but to make it a bit more every day. Um, because it's quite interesting. I mean, I'm from Italy where procurement policy has been quite static in the past. And actually it took a pandemic, the health pandemic for the government to really kind of change some of the ways it was using procurement. And in the process actually created crowded in a lot of a private initiative to deliver on PPEs, on ventilators, et cetera, but that actually created more capacity in the private sector than focusing on the private sector as a thing in and of itself, and industry as a thing in and of itself. There was a strong demand by the government for something it needed, and it quickly kind of redesigned its tools. So, okay, let me jump in there. So, fusion. Um, a Tom, you mentioned this. There's a, a an emerging cluster of fusion companies. Now, I think we all know if we get to net positive energy in, with fusion, that that will have an enormous effect on our grid, our electric grid, that could essentially decarbonize that grid over a fairly short period of time. Um, and so, there's a lot of common good in getting to that goal. But yep. right now, it's almost it's the 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 work of R and D has been subsidized by the government, and now, but once it kind of launches out of the universities, then it's mainly private funds that go to get those companies off the ground, and they could be venture capitalists, it could be family offices, etc. But there is an enormous cost to building the first power plants. Right, these things could each cost a billion dollars. What is the role of government in, in getting these really important technologies to market? And how do we form better partnerships in those phases? You know, we call them first of a kind uh, of sure. almost any of these big technological breakthroughs. Yeah, so I think uh, one challenge you have in the, in the uh, clean energy sector is that uh, you're competing against a commodity. Um, so it may not be an area uh, like in synthetic biology uh, where the industry is able to establish a beachhead, not by going after uh, fuels initially, but by going after higher value added uh, specialty chemicals. Um, but here you're competing against you know, natural gas or coal-fired power plants or uh, other existing technologies. So 
I think particularly if you want to have lots of shots on goal, uh, to have, you know, be experimenting with uh, multiple designs uh, for, for nuclear fusion, uh, then some sort of public-private partnership makes sense. And in, indeed, the House has proposed to take exactly the, the model that NASA used with SpaceX and use it for fusion, uh, where the government is providing a set of uh, fixed-priced milestone payments as a way of cost-sharing uh, in a dealing with some of the large risk. You could also imagine the government participating in some sort of offtake agreement as well, because a lot of new technologies have this problem where upon introduction, uh, they are not going to be able to compete uh, with the incumbent uh, technology in terms of levelized cost of electricity um, and some sort of support may, may be necessary. So, um, you know, I don't think that we can obviously afford to wait around uh, to see if fusion is going to work. I think we also have to move very aggressively on uh, on, on things like solar, wind, uh, storage, uh, electric vehicles, uh, energy efficiency, things like that. Uh, but I do think as part of our portfolio, uh, we should be looking at uh, in, investing in, in some technologies like fusion as, as well. So the reason I sound American, but I'm Italian, <laughs> in case anyone was wondering, uh, was when I was five, we moved from Italy to go to Princeton University so my father could pursue his big kind of fusion dream. And he's still uh, at Princeton trying to do that. Um, and, you know, his view, and, you know, in Italian we say, ogni scarafone bello mamma sua, which means every cockroach is beautiful in his mother's eyes, but I'll do it reverse, every father is beautiful in his daughter's eyes. But if my dad's right, <laughs> he argues actually that what's happened in fusion research is yes, you know, there's the usual kind of joke, it's always 30 years away, but actually what's been defunded recently are precisely that kind of decentralized network of different public labs all over the world that basically once the Cold War finished and you had all the big kind of Soviet scientists going to Wall Street to do derivative models and, <laughs> and that, which partly maybe got us the financial crisis because all these smart people actually ended up in Wall Street instead of the, anyway, we won't go into that. Um, that, that made a huge center like the first change was that you no longer actually had, you know, the Soviet system also contributing to fusion research. That kind of that, that whole science base basically fell. There was much more concentration in the U.S. And then slowly, actually, even more concentration around particular projects. So there's this massive monster called ITER, I-T-E-R, where most of the global public money is. And he argues that actually for, you know, just like with science in general, which often is, you know, goes forwards with serendipity, right, that you actually need a lot of different kind of labs, that unfortunately there's now been this obsession with these little kind of garage fusion experiments at the same time that we're actually defunding some of the proper but decentralized different public labs. And so, you know, it's not inevitable that we actually needed to do it through that kind of Silicon Valley model. We could have actually had a much more healthy ecosystem of a distributive network of well-funded public labs instead of putting all the money just into ITER, one big global kind of huge kind of, you know, castle in the desert. Um, and, and there is something, I think, uh, controversial, if you want, about how science increasingly is being funded by the kind of billionaire, uh, you know, tax evading <laughs> techies. Um, I don't think that actually the basic science has ever evolved that way. It's different for gadgets. You know, it's different for something like an iPhone, which brings together in a really funky way all sorts of different government funded technologies, but funding the basic science through that kind of entrepreneurship um, model. I don't think we have any good examples of where that's worked. If anything, we've hurt it, you know, big science projects like the whole biotech sector, which got a lot of short term exit driven venture capital money, um, you know, ended up getting damaged by that. You know, venture capital wants to exit in a short amount of time through a buyout or an IPO that created in the biotech sector lots of PLEPAs, productless IPOs. Mm -hmm. So the kind of hopes that we had around the Human Genome Project um, were actually affected in some ways by the type of finance that was thrown at it. And I'm not saying that's the case with fusion, but I do think we need to step back a bit and also question whether the system of innovation that we currently have globally has been really skewed towards one big fat public project, no longer decentralized across different countries, or this kind of garage fusion thing, which no one that I know 
that is, you know, an expert uh, from the scientific community actually kind of believes in that stuff. But I might be biased. Okay, so let me push in a little bit more. And Tom, I'm sure you have something to say right now, but I'm just going to clarify the question <laughs> a little bit. But right now, you know, the U.S. has been about kind of bottoms up innovation, lots of government money, seeding companies that are doing this incredible work. But then you kind of let the market take it, whereas China has very um, unified goals and lots of top-down money in into innovation. How does that play out in the world? I, I, is it is it a U.S. versus China thing? Could both develop incredibly important, positive things for the world? Like, how do you think about that? Yeah. So you know, I was around when we were having a similar debate about uh, with respect to Japan, yeah. uh, and. Uh, Jim Fallows wrote a really interesting book called More Like Us, uh, where he said, you know, r rather than saying, OK, uh, you know, Japan has this top down industrial policy uh, and therefore we have to have something like that as well. He said we should figure out what the U.S. strengths are and double down on those. And, and so, you know, I'm broadly sympathetic to that argument. I do think that there are some areas where um, if. Uh, if, if there's an important sector like the semiconductor industry and none of the um, the cutting edge manufacturing is happening in the United States, I think that that may pose some unacceptable risks uh, to the U.S. from a supply chain point of view. Um, and so one of the interesting things that's happened in the U.S. is that both Democrats and Republicans have uh, supported legislation uh, they haven't provided any of the, the funding. They've just authorized it. Uh, but that would equalize the cost in lo locating a, f a fab in the U.S. versus in, in Asia. And I, th I think that there are some sectors where the United States uh, may uh, need to do something like that. But in general, um, I th I'm more supportive of identifying uh, what America's strengths are and doubling down on those, uh, as opposed to saying, well, you know, China has this relationship between uh, the, you know, the Communist Party and the private sector, and therefore we need a similar relationship between uh, the government and 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 the private sector. Um, I I think the the thing that I am worried about is they could do things that are effective but not efficient. In other words, they could say, we think quantum is so important that we're going to spend whatever it takes, even if we wind up wasting a lot of money. Um, and they could be successful in doing that, uh, even though they waste a lot of money. And that's not something that I think the U.S. political system could support. Mm. I mean, one thing I've often said is that China is learning what made America great at the same time that the U.S. is actually seems to be unlearning it. Um, you know, it wasn't mercantilist policies that made America uh, uh, have places like Silicon Valley, but exactly this kind of investment ecosystem that we've been talking about. So if you look at the amount of money that China is throwing at its green transition because of its emergency of pollution, um, it's. It's not just a huge amount. I think it's um, their five-year plan was $1.7 trillion across many different sectors, very much using that portfolio approach that we talked about before. And this is greening their manufacturing base, really. Um, but also different types of institutions. So they also have you know, public financial institutions like the Chinese Development Bank, as well as, of course, their you know, Academy of Sciences. They don't, however, I think, have you know this kind of decentralized network of different or types of public and private organizations across that whole innovation chain. So that's a big question, whether they will get stuck in that kind of Soviet-style big clunky uh, mode, right? So the Soviet Union was was spending a lot on research and development more than Japan, but Japan had a much more nimble innovation system in terms of also those kind of science industry linkages that we all know are very important. But one interesting thing with China is that you have than some countries that aren't seeing it as a threat, but as an opportunity, right? So Denmark, tiny little country, um, is currently the number one provider of high-tech green services to China's green transition. And that's, you know, those kinds of dynamic startups, which then scaled up through Denmark's own kind of public mission setting, like their own carbon neutral uh, city plans, 
then ended up finding a, you know, a market in China precisely because a lot of the policies there, again, were mission, or, mission oriented around particular regions and also that kind of cross-sectoral um, way of thinking about a green transition, so not just about renewable energy. Um, the other really interesting thing, I think, is what's been happening in Germany with their energy, energy vende, uh mission is they've ended up using that, again, as an opportunity to restructure public-private partnerships. So when an old sector like steel um, you know, goes to the government saying, bail me out, help, as the steel sector has been doing um, across the world because it's in trouble, the German government used its energy policy its renewable energy policy to then create strong conditions for the steel sector to reduce its material content in order to access those public funds. And they did that through innovation around repurpose, reuse, recycle. So they are currently one of the greenest steel sectors in the world. And I think that comes back down to that public-private relationship. How can we, instead of just thinking about helping a sector when it's in need, use an ambition like the green targets to actually um, transform the sector as opposed to just bailing it out. And I think that's a big lesson also now with COVID with all the bailouts. And um, Ma Macron, actually, interestingly, President Macron in France was very clear. He said, we're not here just to save industry, but to help transform it towards our sustainability targets. One thing that I wanted to hop in on is that um, I'm a big fan of identifying some of these outcomes. Uh, but I also think that we don't, we can't overlook the serendipitous nature of the scientific enterprise. Um, and so one of my favorite examples is uh, the reason that we have uh, green fluorescent protein, uh, which plays a critical role in biomedical research, is that uh, someone was studying why jellyfish glow in the dark. Uh, and so no policymaker is going to say, you know, we need to have a crash program to understand why jellyfish glow in the dark. Uh, so I think what we're talking, I think, uh, I don't want to speak for Mariana, but I, I think she would agree that we need a portfolio approach yeah. and that in some areas um, we need to give scientists and, en and engineers uh, the freedom uh, to explore what they think is intellectually interesting. Um, and in other areas, we have some particular outcome that we're trying to achieve, and we're trying to mobilize the research community in the private sector to achieve that goal, and, and both are important. So the, the generation coming up out of college right now in grad school is, I mean, they are super focused on change, they they are rabidly, you know, looking at you know how do we make society more equal? How do whether by race or gender or many other um, divides, right? But if you look in the U.S., we have the least scientifically oriented Congress, or. or or other forms of government. And so there's this real divide in understanding technology and its role in shaping society. So Tom, I'm going to start with Tom and then I'll go to Mariana. If you're thinking about how to motivate this next generation to contribute to government and entrepreneurship, how do we do that so that when we're creating policies that we are more literate about what they mean across the entire Congress? Yeah, so um, there are two models uh, that I think are really promising. Um, one is is a model that the Obama administration embraced after the failed rollout of healthcare.gov, um, and that is the notion of a tour of duty. So there are a number of, of top people in software engineering and product management and human-centered design that we were able to convince to join the government uh, and to get uh, healthcare.gov back on track. And many of them stayed. Many of them said that what I'm doing now is you know, vastly more consequential and personally meaningful than what I was doing um, uh, working in, in Silicon Valley. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the ways in which we can reduce the technical divide between uh, the government uh, and the private sector is to say to people, hey, we're not asking you to be a civil servant for 40 years. Mm -hmm. We're asking you to come into government for some fixed period of time and help contribute to some 
really important uh, societal challenge. Um, so if you're a DARPA program manager, you have a date on your uh, badge that says when you will be leaving. Um, and that both increases the number of people that DARPA can recruit, uh, because again, you're not asking for this indefinite commitment, but it also creates a sense of urgency uh, you know, someone who's going to be in the government for 40 years may say, well, you know, if I didn't get around to it this year, there's always next year. Um, if you're a DARPA program manager, one year is 25% of the time that you're going to be in government. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that right now, the U.S. government has two ways of supporting uh, young scientists and engineers. One is providing support uh, for graduate students, and then the second is postdocs. I think we need to create a third mechanism, which is as a entrepreneurial scientist and engineer who is helping to commercialize the results of, of their research. Um, and so I think we need to recognize that as a category uh, and to, to have uh, mechanisms like Cyclotron Road and, uh, and Activate and the uh, Cornell Tech Startup Postdoc Program to recognize that this can be of a viable career option, uh, and we're going to provide you with support uh, and places for you to be where you have access to uh, cutting edge uh, facilities. And I think an expanded program like that, in the same way that we support grad students and postdocs, would allow the public to get uh, more results uh, from the from the basic research that the federal government is currently supporting. So those are two things that would be on my short list of things to do. Okay, and for you, Mariana, um, we know that there is a divide between what we invest into the labs and then commercialization of pro products. The UK has done many different things to spur angel investment or seed capital investment. But if you're looking at kind of these deep tech startups and that valley of death that we know that exists, what role could the government play with taxation or, you know, that could spur investment into that and get some of these transformational technologies faster to market. How do you think about that? So first, I don't actually think too much about tax. <laughs> um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the most regressive taxation policies we've had that have increased inequality have been lobbied for through stories about innovation that are just completely false. <laughs> so it was actually the National Venture Capital Association that back in the late 70s lobbied for the capital gains tax to fall by 50% in just four years, and that did nothing uh, but you know, basically make them rich. That's not what actually stimulated the investment. If you look at where venture capital then invested, it was very much, um, if you look at what happened both in biotech and nanotech and the internet today and space tech and green tech, on the back actually of public money. So where the perceptions of future opportunities lie drives um, investment, business investment and VC investment. On top of that, once you actually have catalyzed that perception of where future opportunities lie, you can have well-designed, de uh, say, R&D tax credits or, or other types of um, tax incentives like that, but that doesn't tend to create additionality. It doesn't tend to create you know, investment, for example, in R&D where it wouldn't have happened anyway. Um, and in fact, you know, policies like the patent box, which is a tax uh, reduction for profits associated with different types of intellectual property rights, it makes no sense, right? A patent is already a 20-year monopoly that the government is giving to a private company because monopolies don't come from God, they come from government. Um, and so you've already taken care of the incentive problem. It makes no sense then to reduce tax, again, on the profits generated. So what you actually require from government, I think, is that kind of distributed capacity, strategic mission-oriented investments, patient long-term finance, and you know, different types of policies that can then help startups to scale up, as we've talked about, you know, the SBIR kinds of uh, funds in the US that set that something like two to 3% of each department's um, procurement budget had to be aimed towards small medium enterprises that has uh, over time actually created a market creation kind of opportunity uh, for small medium enterprises. So those kinds of policies I think have been 
very successful in the UK, this idea, oh, we have great universities, uh, you know, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, et cetera. We aren't commercializing, so it must be the lack of venture capital. You know, that, that hasn't worked because actually what's missing in the US, uh, sorry, in the UK is precisely that distributed capacity across different types of active mission-oriented uh, public institutions that the US has had. And to be honest, in recent times, I'd say from Thatcher onwards, a bit of a confusion of what the state is actually for. So a lot of outsourcing, actually, of public sector capacity to the big four consulting companies. This has become really uh, very um, highlighted now with COVID, where we've had to use Deloitte <laughs> to do testing, uh, and they ended up actually losing the test. So you know, reducing the capacity within the public sector is not the way to have kind of moonshot approaches. You need both public and private, but you need strong systems underlying them. We wouldn't have gotten to the moon without a strong defense system and space uh, sector system. It wasn't just the kind of NASA uh, unit. And so, um, you know, one of the reasons I think that the U.S. government, under Obama at least, was able to recruit, just coming back to your previous question, a top scientist, a Nobel Prize winning physicist to run the Department of Energy, um, and, and he ended up setting up ARPA-E, so his name was Steve Chu, was not because, you know, the, the, the task at hand was come in and help us de-risk, you know, Elon Musk. It was, hey, you know, we're going to try to actually have a proper stimulus package after the financial crisis, $800 billion in a stimulus package. And Obama's goal, at least initially, was to have it very much be a fiscal stimulus for a green direction of the country. So, of course, uh, you know, a physicist interested in uh, sustainability and green and clean innovation will see that as an honor to head up a unit that is going to help steer an economy. Whereas if we confuse what the role of government is, which is to at best fix market failures and get the hell out of the way so the entrepreneurs can do their thing, it's not even that attractive to go be a, you know, a civil servant. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have two minutes left. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to talk about one thing that I think universities could do um, and that is to empower students to major in a discipline, but minor in a problem. Yeah. So we talk about how we want people who are T-shaped. What if the top of the T were a problem? Yeah. So for example, if they wanted to understand, uh, you know, safe drinking water, uh, you know, not just looking at this from an engineering point of view, but from a political, social, cultural, and, and policy point of view, so that they really have a systems perspective. And so by the time they graduate, they are both inspired and empowered to work on, you know, for example, uh, one of the SDGs. Uh, so what are the curricular, co-curricular, and experiential learning opportunities that they would need to make some important contribution to a big problem, either at home or abroad? That's a cool, very cool idea. Yeah. So, so Mariana, last last words. Um, you know, tell me. I, I know you have an upcoming book. What are you hoping to achieve with that book? And uh, can you give us a little preview? So the book is actually oh God, what is it called? Mission Mission uh, <laughs> Mission Economy: A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism. And it kind of breaks down this, these issues that we've just been talking about specifically, though, because what really interests me is this new public-private uh, partnership that we should be going after. Because otherwise, at best, you have the kind of Davos talk about you know, purpose and stakeholder value, but then the way that we actually collaborate remains this kind of old-style one that replicates this idea of, again, that the entrepreneurs or the creative ones in governments, they're just facilitating and at best funding some of the basic science. And so I kind of break down the Apollo program around what did it mean, actually, uh, what did it mean for how we recruited uh, people into government, what it meant for procurement, what it meant for the kind of pricing um, you know, issues that Tom was just talking about, and, and then ask what would it look like if we actually were just as ambitious and outcomes oriented towards the biggest problems of our time, climate being one, but of course the health pandemic again has given us all sorts of other really obvious problems that we're facing every day. But I basically talk about the sustainable development goals, but it, it's it's almost a how-to manual. It's like, all right, how are we actually going to, um, you know, rethink industrial strategy, procurement policy, public-private partnerships, the contracts, the um, you know, in areas also like health innovation, where there's plenty of partnerships, but as I was saying before, they've been very problematic ones. I think in terms of not being formulated around the common good. 
So we need not just the poetry, but the prose yes. of this. <laughs> exactly. So I want to thank both of you so much for coming and having this conversation today. It was awesome and look forward to seeing what you create in the world um, over the next few years. So thank you. Thank you very much. See ya. See ya.